Hi, so today I'll be showing you how to tell different 19th century fashion decades apart. We're not gonna be talking about what affected fashion, but rather what the clothes looked like. Everything in fashion happens gradually, so to understand what was going on at the beginning of a new century, let's move back a bit to 1790s. 1790s were a transition period, a new slender silhouette came to fashion, but it took a while till the ladies got rid of their bum rolls, wigs and white petticoats. That's why, in some Jane Austen movie adaptations, you can still see the older generation wearing older 18th century gowns, while the youngsters are dressed in the Empire fashion. So, in 1790s the waist gradually went higher, the skirts got narrower, the hair smaller, though ladies still used to powder them, turbans and ostrich feathers were the thing. Sleeves were usually elbow length. What's typical for the era is that the skirts were gathered at the back of the dress, but also in front. That's why when we look at some of the 1790s fashion plates nowadays, all of the ladies look kind of pregnant. Also, if you look at the back of a late 1790s or early 1800s dress, you can notice a very peculiar cut. The sleeves heads were pushed back towards the shoulder blades and the back of the dress was very short, with the shortest point being in the center. Women would even pat this bit of the skirt to make it look fuller. Despite a circulating stereotype, this new silhouette did not make women toss corsets away. Some brave French fashionistas were not wearing them, that's true, but corsets never completely disappeared. Mainly because the new silhouette required your bust to basically touch your chin. And what better way to achieve that than some good old push-up bra? I mean, stays. The beginning of the 1800s saw the death of the heavily powdered hair and classicism-inspired hairdos became all the rage. Women would style their coiffures after antique sculptures and paintings. The dresses also changed. Everyone got crazy about light, delicate fabrics. The skirts trains were getting longer and longer, the busts were higher than ever and the bodices were really short. By 1810, the super long trains were no longer in fashion, no longer get it, haha. The skirts got wider and they became more trapezoidal in shape. Rich Indian silks became fashionable. The waist began gradually dropping around 1815. Also, the later in the decade, the more decoration on the everyday outfits. Grecian and Roman hairstyles were adapted into a very popular look, which included curls on both sides of the face together with an intricate abdu. 1820s were a transitional period from a classical empire silhouette to the crazily over-the-top 1830s. So the skirts got wider and wider, shorter and shorter, the waist dropped lower and lower, the sleeves grew bigger and bigger, and more and more decorations started to appear on the dresses. The hem of the skirts was padded to help achieve the trapezoidal shape. In 1830s, everything kept growing until the middle of the decade. And let me tell you, it got really intense. Women would wear multiple petticoats, some of them stiffened by cording or horsehair, to hold the volume of the skirts that were now shorter than ever. They even wore special sleeve supports to make the sleeves bigger. The waist was pretty low at this point, but still a bit higher than ladies' natural waists. Thanks to Queen Victoria, who was coronated in 1837, modesty and minimalism came to fashion. 
From 1836, everything started decreasing. The sleeve puffs started moving downwards, the decorations started disappearing, the skirts were back to floor length, the abdus got flat, and in the late 1830s, the waist finally reached its natural position. 1840s were a decade of early collars, fitted pointy bodices and fitted sleeves, tight collars usually separately attached, and small geometrical patterns. Basically everything got tighter and the only thing that kept growing was the width of women's skirts that required more and more support. Popular hairstyle was the low bun and the middle parting, and that with some minor modifications was a hot look up until the late 1860s. In the 1850s, the problem of growing skirts became so big, big, got it, that it was necessary to develop a special construction to help them stay in shape and not floppy. That construction was called crinoline, and it was patented in 1856. Now note that the crinoline did not exist until then, so if you hear about 18th century crinolines, that's absolute nonsense. 18th century ladies wore hoop skirts or panniers. 1850s skirts were often ruffled, which is an easy way to tell them apart from 1840s skirts. Same goes for the sleeves, which in the 1850s were wide and called pagoda sleeves. Women would often wear fake white sleeves underneath, so they could peek from the pagoda sleeves. The waist dropped a little bit below the actual waist level and got longer in the front. Plaid dresses were all the rage, as well as floral motifs. In the 1860s, the shape of the whole silhouette started changing. After the waist reached its lowest point in 1850s, it started going a little bit above the natural waist level in the 1860s. Buttoned bodices became fashionable, the ruffled plaid skirts were gone, and instead plain, solid collars were in fashion with geometrical trimmings such as the Greek key decorating the hems. The shape of the skirt changed slightly and so did the shape of the crinoline underneath, accentuating the back. Apart from being gathered or pleated at the waist, some skirts were also made of panels. From about 1867, the transitional period started. The waist would start traveling even higher, but the skirt this time, instead of expanding or decreasing, would start getting more volume at the back. It would also gradually become more and more decorated. The crinolines gradually morphed into crinolettes and then, around the beginning of 1870s, into bustles. That's how we enter the bustle era. The 70s were a decade I would compare to 1830s. Big hair, a lot of decorations, frills, flowers, laces, pinks and pastels. A huge inspiration for 1870s was 18th century fashion, and you can kind of tell. Even the hairstyles were sort of Marie Antoinette inspired. Some people would literally take old family dresses from, let's say, 1780s and redo them into fashionable creations. Dresses were also influenced by Renaissance and medieval fashions. About the butts. The 1870s bustle was large and the skirt was in trapezoidal shape. To accentuate the silhouette even more, women would wear two skirts. One of them was an underskirt, which went surprise surprise under, and the other went on top and was called the overskirt. Overskirts were draped to make the butts look even bigger. And then suddenly the butts disappeared. Around 1878, women dropped the big bustles and chose to wear small bumpads instead. The skirts got really narrow, but instead of the fullness, the designers came up with length and added long trains. This look, called the natural form era, lasted for only about four years, because around 1882, the bustles were back on tracks. 
Remember what happened after 1830s? Minimalism, geometry, earthy tones, strictness, well, this sort of happened after the 1870s too. 1880s are known as the Second Basel Era, and though at first glance might look similar to 1870s, there are some significant differences that make it easier to tell them apart. Firstly, the skirts are not the trapezoidal shape anymore, they were just a little bit wider than the hips. Secondly, the shape of the corset changed slightly. Spoon basked corsets came into fashion, giving the illusion of a full belly, and I swear I'm not making it up. And from a more harsh geometrical 1870s shape, a curvy, wavy 1880s shape evolved. Thirdly, the bustle's shape, or rather angle, changed. Instead of gradually going down, the bustles formed a sort of shelf on the ladies' bottoms. Fourthly, if that's even a word, ladies' hairstyles changed. Women would also start cutting their forehead hair and setting it into frizzy bangs. Not the most flattering look, but if you have bangs, this is one of the rare 19th century fashion history moments when this look is historically accurate. So as you probably noticed, changes in fashion history usually start with something gradually growing or decreasing or getting longer or shorter. So because skirts kept changing all the time, at the beginning of the 1890s, people were like, hey, what about the sleeves? Sleeves it is then. From 1890 to around 1895, the sleeves were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And to balance the huge sleeves, their skirts also had to get wider. If you wonder what happened to the bustle, well, it kind of disappeared. The only reminder that the bustle was ever there was a peculiar pleat at the back of the skirts in the early 1890s, but those pleats disappeared after a while too. 1890s were a time where Art Nouveau was kind of huge, so you can see that in the clothes and the way they're cut and made. Floral and and geometrical designs covered the dresses, jackets, and coats from the era. What I especially love about the 1890s is the colors. So especially the coats and capes from the era, jackets, and generally speaking outerwear often had very high spiky colors, you know, the maleficent kind of color. The skirts changed once again, from trapezoidal white skirts in the middle of 1890s to tulip-shaped narrower skirts by the end of the decade. Later in the decade, women also started getting rid of the weird frizzy bangs, and a puffy, more Art Nouveau appropriate style was introduced. 1890s were the time of a big discussion around tight lacing, corsets, and how they affect women's health. Tight lacing wasn't very popular before, but by the end of 19th century, more and more fashionistas desired small waists. So the solution to the problem was an invention of an S-band corset or a health corset in 1900. It completely changed women's silhouette, but that's kind of a whole another story, so maybe I'll tell you about that when we're discussing 20th century. I hope now when you hear about something being Victorian or 19th century style, you'll know there is no such thing, because 19th century was such a huge piece of fashion history with countless silhouettes, cuts, and styles. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this messy explanation, obviously, I missed on a lot of things, and some things I listed as a typical thing for one decade were actually also popular in other decades, but just to give you a general idea. Okay, thanks for listening, and see you next time, hopefully.